Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's Pyramids here and welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful day, morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. And I want to read to you guys real quick a part of the uh, Before the Storm book, which came out uh, prior to the release of Battle for Azeroth, because this book has a lot of really valuable information in it. Uh, and I want to talk to you guys today about one particular character from it, Kalia Menethil, the sister of Arthas Menethil and Queen of Lordaeron. Now, in the book, uh, there is a meeting that is established between some of the forsaken undead of the Undercity and some of the former citizens and family members of uh, they who uh, were from Lordaeron. And this meeting is orchestrated between Sylvanas and Anduin. Uh, it's supposed to be a peaceful meeting. And unfortunately, Kalia Menethil showed up with her own goals um, and uh, purpose, uh, as directed, apparently, by Anaru, um, in order to help these Forsaken defect to the Alliance and uh, escape the grasp of Sylvanas. And for this, uh, usur usurping, which is what this is, trying to get others to defect to your side, for doing this, uh, Sylvanas kills Kalia Menethil, and Anduin is really distraught about this. Um, so we're going to pick up where... It leaves off, and it says here, The next few days were a blur of regret, pain, and soul-searching for Anduin Wren. Gen, predictably, had been furious, but to Anduin's surprise, he had bitten his tongue when the young king walked through the gates of Stromgard, carrying the body of Kalia Menethil. Fowl was heartbroken, receiving the corpse of his beloved friend humbly from Anduin's arms, as stunned as Anduin had been at Kalia's turn and riddled with remorse for not anticipating it. I would have never brought her today if I had the slightest idea, he said. I know, Anduin said. Take her home, and I will do the same for my people. I'll come to the temple as soon as I can. And they're talking about the Netherlight Temple. The priest order hall from Legion. It tore at him to see the people who had once been so full of hope look so shocked and devastated as they boarded the ships that had borne them to the Arathi Highlands and its ghosts. Even those who had not parted well from their forsaken counterparts looked shaken. Anduin usually was able to find the right words at the right time, but now he found none. What could he tell them, really? How could he possibly comfort them? There was no easy, obvious road back from this, and so he retired to his cabin deep in prayer for guidance. It came in the form of a knock on the door, in the appearance of an old friend. I do not wish to disturb, Velen said. Anduin smiled wearily. You never could, he said, and invited the Drenai inside. He offered some refreshment, but Velen declined gracefully. I will not stay long, Velen said, but I felt I should come. You are king now, not the youth I guided only a few short years ago back on the Exodar, but I will always be there if you ever wish that wisdom the light sees fit for me to give you. So, recall that Anduin Wren has actually learned some teachings of the light from Velen. Velen being pff, potentially 20,000 plus years old, who even knows how old Velen actually is? Um, he's so old that his people started to call him the Ageless One. Uh, that's pretty fucking old. Uh, he's also had tremendous amount of contact with the Naru, as we're going to see moving forward. I do want to note how interesting it is that it says, The wisdom that the light sees fit for me to give you. A little bit interesting. Velen doubtless thought the reminder of Anduin's time among the Drenai would be comforting, but all Anduid can think of now was how much he longed for those days, for that peace. And before he knew what was happening, he had blurted out, I feel helpless, Velen. I promised my people a reunion with their loved ones. Instead, they watched them be slaughtered. I want to comfort them, but I have no words. I miss my time learning from you. I miss the Exodar. I miss Oros, which is a uh, Naru. Velen smiled sadly. We all do, he said but we cannot go back to happier times. We can only live in the present, and right now, that present is painful. But we do have a way to be with the Naru. We are priests, Anduin, but we cannot heal others until we are steady and calm within ourselves. Go to the Netherlight Temple now. Share your grief with Fal, and in doing so, help each other. Speak with Sa'ara. See what it has to say to you. There is time. Then you can greet your people on the docks and, light willing, know what to say to help their wounded hearts. Anduin smiled. I'll never be as wise as you, old friend. Velen chuckled and shook his head ruefully. 
My only wisdom is to understand that I am not. The Netherlight Temple When Anduin entered the temple, he saw at once that something was happening. It seemed as though everyone in the temple had clustered around the entrance to Sa'ada's chamber, another Naru, which was marked by its constant radiance. Anduin, frowning, hastened toward the crowd, making his way through the priests who stood or knelt, silent, reverent. Up ahead, Anduin could see the radiant lilac form of Sa'ada, and despite his heartache and confusion, he felt the Naru's comforting brush upon his spirit. It's interesting there, because it's relating the shape of the Naru to that of a flower. Remember that. Kaliamenethil's body hovered in front of Sa'ada. She laid in the air as if she were sleeping. Her hands folded on her breast. Her blonde hair gleamed almost as brightly as the Naru itself, falling softly, her golden white robes draping her slender frame. Fowl knelt in front of the crystalline entity, his head bowed in prayer. High Priestess Ashana stepped beside Anduin and said quietly, Something is happening to Kalia. Her flesh has not begun to decompose. Fowl has been with her since he brought her here. The Drenai turned, looking down at Anduin as she said, Sa'ada told him to wait for you, my young king. A shiver ran down Anduin's spine, and he swallowed. He took a deep breath and stepped toward the archbishop. I'm here, your grace, he said quietly. What would you have me do? Fowl turned his face up to Anduin's. I'm not quite sure, he said. But Sa'ada was insistent that you were here to be part of this. And then Sa'ada, who had been silent, spoke into their minds. Kalia would come to me when the dreams of what was past were too painful to endure, Sa'ada said. I cautioned her to have patience. There were things she had to do before the dreams would cease, things she must understand, people who would need her help. And I assured her of this seemingly strange truth, that sometimes the most beautiful and important gifts come wrapped in pain and blood. And... One thing I want to throw out there is that when Callie Minitha was out on the field and she came to the sudden realization that she needed to try to get these people to defect to the Alliance, it clicked in Kalia's head that this was the moment that Sa'ada had been telling her about. Now, if you guys don't know, Kalia Minitha was actually in the Priest Order Hall in Legion, so she's had contact with these Naru, which, by the way, we don't really know where they came from, but I believe that they were forged by the Titans, my personal opinion. That being said... In the moment when Kalia Menethil came to realize that she needed to do this, she said to herself, this was the moment that Sa'ada was talking about. It was time. Now remember that phrase, it was time, because we are going to come back to that and it's very important. This is what's, that's what's said afterwards. The truth of those words hit Anduin's heart. Those were the gifts that no one ever wanted, that one would do anything not to have bestowed. But they were also, indeed, as Sa'ada said, beautiful and important. There will be no more of those battles for her now. Kalia Menethil will be freed from the pains of the living, from the nightmares that once rent her heart. She understood that those on that field were her people, and she accepted that responsibility by giving her life to try to save them. Not human, as they were when she was young, but forsaken, as they were in that moment. Light and dark. Forsaken priest and human priest. Together, you shall bring her back as the light, and as she herself would have her be. Anduin's mouth was dry, and he trembled. He looked at Fowl, but the priest only nodded. They moved wordlessly to Kalia's side, standing as she hovered in midair, and each of them took one of her small, pale hands. Bring her back as the light, and she herself would have her be, Sa'ada had said. He didn't know what the Naru had meant by those words, and he suspected that Fowl didn't either. But somehow... He knew. Kalia did. Uh, that's a pretty heavy hinting that Fowl and Anduin don't know what's going on. They don't understand, at least Anduin doesn't, and he thinks Fowl doesn't, they don't understand what they're about to do. They don't know what Sa'ada means by Kalia Menethil coming back as the light would have her be. What the fuck does that even mean? Because remember, Velen said, I'm here to give you the wisdom that the light thinks that I should give you. So this is really illustrating to me that the light has its own kind of personality or perhaps entity behind it as a force, and it has motive. It's not just some random acting force. Through the Naru, the light is actually executing some type of grander plan. And based on what we saw with Illidan and Zira, I think it's pretty inarguable that the light definitely has some form of, of plan that is being executed here. 
considering the fact that Illidan Stormrage is allegedly a boy who was prophesized, literally prophesized by the light, to bring an end to the Age of Demons. That's that's pretty substantial right there, because that's that's almost like divine destiny, something written by the, par the power and hand of gods. You see where I'm going with this? It's uh, pretty fucking, pretty interesting. Um, and what it means to be brought back as the light would have you be, and as she herself would have her be, they're separating what the light wants and what Kaliaminatha would have wanted. And the fact of the matter is, is that Anduin is acknowledging that he doesn't know what that means. I think to point out that the light can basically do whatever the fuck it wants. We don't know what the light is doing. We don't know what it means for the light to come back as 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 it would want Kaliaminathil to. But somehow, Anduin knows, Kalian is knows what that means. Anduin felt the light come to him, warm and calming. It seeped through his body, soothing his spirit and his tumultuous mind. It was a familiar sensation, yet there was something different. He usually experienced the light's power flowing through him like a river, but now it seemed like a whole ocean was utilizing him as a vessel. Anduin felt a quick flicker of fear. Would he be able to contain and direct something this powerful? With the light flowing through you, the last thing that I would love to hear is that someone feels fear from it. Like, that is not fucking good. Isn't the light supposed to, like, flood you with hope and banish fear? So for Anduin to be feeling fear as the light, which I presume is coming from this Naru, is flowing through him, that's not good. <laughs> uh, he anticipated that he would feel overwhelmed, stretched to his limit, but the tide of light that swept through him now was one that reinvigorated him, even as it asked him to be fully present, to give all of himself to the task ahead. Yes, he said in his heart, I will. The light limbed him in its warm hue, and it chased around the still yet completely intact body of the Queen of Lordaeron and whirled about the forsaken Archbishop. Anduin felt it swirl like a wave, then crest and break, emptying him, but not depleting him. The cold hand in his squeezed. Anduin gasped as Kalia opened her eyes. They glowed a soft, gentle white, not the eerie yellow hue of a forsaken's. A smile curved a face that had no flush of life to it. Slowly, her body tilted from horizontal to vertical, and her feet settled onto the stone floor. So, for Kalia to come back with white eyes, there's only like two or three characters in the whole game that have white eyes. Norganon the Dreamweaver, Dreamweaver, Ysera the Dreamer, who is an aspect of the Titan of Life, Aenar, and Aenar the Lifebinder herself. I have said for quite a long time, and I will continue to say this, that the Holy Light and the Naru are tools that are being used by the Titans to fulfill destiny in order to stop Sargeras and to stop the, the forces of the darkness that are encroaching upon us. And the way that this has affected Sylvanas by basically making her look like a huge bitch by killing some of her own people, as if she hasn't already done enough to make herself look like a huge bitch, uh, what this has done is definitely driven a wedge between some of the Forsaken and Sylvanas, uh, and it's only helped to strengthen the alliance. And it's actually also led to this, the resurrection of Kaliaminathil, which again, Anduin doesn't even know the purpose of. Velen is the one that told Anduin to come to the fucking Netherlight Temple, and Velen is among the first to, as far as we know, ever have contact with Naru, who stand for order, hope, and the preservation of life. Hmm, that's kind of weird. So it's almost like the goals of the Titans, specifically that of Aenar and Amenthul, align pretty much directly with the goals of the Naru, which is, again, kind of strange, kind of weird that that's going on. And it just so happens that the Naru and the Army of the Light headed the attack against the Burning Legion and the assault on Argus. Is this all that coincidental? I don't know, let's keep reading. Kaliamenethil was dead, but she lived. She was no mindless undead, but she was not forsaken either. She had been raised by a human and a forsaken, both using the power of the light bathed in the radiance of Anaru. Kalia, said Fal, and his voice trembled. Welcome back, dear girl. I didn't dare hope that you would return to us. And here is where one of the biggest hints comes from. And Blizzard's not hiding it here. They're making it really obvious. Someone once told me that hope is what you have when all other things have failed you, Kalia said to him. Her voice was echoing, sepulchral. 
but like Fowl's, it was warm and kind. Her white gaze went to Anduin. She smiled gently. Where there is hope, you make room for healing for all things that are possible, and some that are not. Anduin watched as everyone responded to Kalia's, what? Resurrection? No, she was still dead. Dark gift? That wouldn't be accurate either, because it was the light that had been present today. There was nothing of darkness in this undead woman. So, what she says right here, where there is hope, you make room for healing, for all things that are possible, and some that are not. When all else has failed you, when all other things have failed you. Remember when we fought Argus the Unmaker? One of the things Argus the Unmaker literally says during the fight is no hope, just pain, only pain. Then Argus proceeds to suck us all into a black little black hole and kill us all in one swipe. We have basically been reaped by death at that point. Amunthul, who was the last person to try to intervene on what Argus was doing alongside Norganon, Agrimar, Kazgaroth, and Golgoneth, all four have, of them by that time in the fight had actually tried to help us. All other things had failed. Who is the one that steps in and resurrects us when we die? Oh yeah, it's Aenar. And what does she say right before she does it? Oh, that's right. She says, hope is not lost, High Father. The spark of life still flickers within these mortals. Where hope existed, Aenar, the life binder, made room for healing and for something that was not possible, because all of the other forces had failed. When you have a pantheon of gods, and you have one of them like Argus, who seemingly represents shadow and death, and you have one like Aenar, who seemingly represents uh, life, and potentially even light, as Velen says in Alternate Draenor, light is life and life is light. The two are interchangeable and nothing is ever lost. You have these gods, and the goddess, and the god of death literally reaps away these mortals. And then in front of the pantheon of other gods, including Amunthul, basically Father Time and or Zeus, uh, basically breaks the natural order of the universe by resurrecting living beings who were just executed and terminated by the god of death itself. So it is in a way representative that life is triumphing over death right in that moment. That is not natural order, okay? That is something that should not have happened. And as Anduin says in his address uh, to his people in the cinematics that followed the events of Antorus and followed the stabbing in Silithus, Anduin said in his uh, cutscene, uh, we did the impossible. We defeated the Burning Legion, and Anduin is right. Anduin acknowledges that we did something that should have literally been impossible. But because hope existed at the seat of the Pantheon, we did the impossible. As Kalia said, you make room for all things that are possible and some that are not. Do you see where I'm going with this? The fact that Kalia Menethil, her body wasn't even decaying, that she's brought back by a Naru with white eyes, just like the fucking life binder herself, and then uses a quote that directly aligns with something that happened with the Lifebinder recently in the fucking game. And this is what I've been trying to tell people about the force of light. It does not come from where people presume that it does. Zira herself says that the Naru were forged during the great ordering of the cosmos. Who do you suppose was doing the great ordering of the cosmos? If it wasn't the Titans, then I'd love to know who the fuck it was and who forged these beings of light known as Naru. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so... I think maybe I'm just being overconfident, but I think it's so glaringly in your face of where the light is coming from. The light is this divine magic that seems to be able to alter fate that allowed people like Tyrion to break out of the bindings of ice given to him by the Lich King and enact his oath of retribution against Arthas Menethil. It's, it, the, the light has allowed for absolutely incredible things to happen. Things that are literally fate-breaking. It has allowed people to be resurrected or be saved from these forces that they should not have ever been able to escape from. And that, I'm not saying that because I think that evil or whatever, bad or dark, should just... Which people equate so, so directly so often. Dark is often just the badness. And light is often just the goodness. I'm not saying that dark should 
necessarily just dominate the universe. No, there needs to be a balance of the two. But what's happening right now is that when death is literally plunged into someone via an arrow like Kaliaminithil, beings of the light like Sa'ara and now Anduin Rin and Alonzo's Fowl are intervening on the natural fucking way of the universe. And, and we now have our first light undead. And you remember that Nazoth quote that just came up pretty recently? The light has struck a bargain with the enemy of all? Yeah, it's the undead. And now what's going to happen? If you're a forsaken undead and you've seen what Sylvanas has been doing, you start to think, man, the Alliance has this offer of light. They can potentially make us all rebound in the light. We are freed from this pain and this torment and the body stops decaying. Do you think that it's unlikely that the forsaken start to in greater numbers potentially defect to the alliance and start to join this this light undead thing i mean it is a potential for an allied race as well as some people have brought up before but you think this is a good thing for sylvanas that this happened no sylvanas acted out of fear she acted out of anger once again just like she did at teldrassil when she looked at dalaran summermoon and saw a visage of herself in dalaran summermoon it's it's pretty pretty uh Interesting how they've drawn these parallels between the way that Dalaran Summermoon died and the way that Sylvanas died. Uh, Sylvanas clinging on to hope, and then in her banshee form and what followed afterwards, her coming to realize that she was a fool and hope fails and life is pain and all this stuff. Sylvanas is just as unbalanced as something like the light because Sylvanas allows fear to drive her actions very immensely. Ironically enough, it just so happens that in the mists of Pandaria, from the burdens of Shao Hao uh, short stories that we were able to get uh, nice little videos on, you should check them out on YouTube, they're really good, we learn you can't let fear drive you because your fear will completely destroy you. It will cause you to make terrible, horrible decisions. Uh, it drives you to terrible actions, tell Drusil. Uh, and you need to be able to find a way to face your fear uh, and not let it overcome you. This is actually a lesson that Anduin Rin has learned. Uh, however, I don't think Sylvanas has, and so I would wager that it is possible that, forthcoming in the story, Anduin Rin will in some way teach Sylvanas to stand up to her fear and to her anger, and this will change Sylvanas' character in a way that puts her in a better light. But I digress. Let's let's head back to what, what we were talking about with the light. What happens now? Now that we have Anduin Rin, who, as we saw at the Battle of Lordaeron, has an incredible apt uh, aptitude for wielding the light. tell you when anduin reaches up into the sky and he calls down this basically god beam of holy light uh that is absolutely astounding that anduin Rin was able to do that i would wager that not even arthas menethil could do that i would wager that it's likely that even Turalyon can't even do something like that i've only ever seen one character in the in the whole rest of the game do something like that and guess who it was oh it was prophet velen when he basically made this giant protective bubble of light around his people in the Exodar when the Legion was attacking it at the start of Legion. Speaking of Velen, what about alternate Velen, who right before his sacrifice into this giant beam of darkness in order to restore the light to Anaru, what about when he looked at Urel in alternate Draenor, and he transferred the little Naru sign on his head right onto her forehead, and then, wow, guess what? Velen goes up into that Naru, the Naru is reborn in light, and all of a sudden, now, on alternate Drenor, the same Drenor that uh, that happened with Urelon, we have these light-bound being led by a Naru, uh, and Urel commanding them, enforcing the light upon the Maghar. So what do we suppose is going to start happening on Azeroth, especially if those Maghar orcs and Urel, which I think this is very likely, come from alternate Drenor? What happens when in the potential Silvermoon Warfront, which has been datamined uh, a while ago, 
in the Sunwell, what happens if the uh, the Drenai and the Naru from alternate Drenor come through the fucking Sunwell, similar to how Kill Jaden did from Argus, uh, as a portal to get into Azeroth to bolster the forces of the Alliance? Also, if uh, you go back and do the Sunwell at the end after you defeat Kill Jaden, when Velen comes through his little portal with his army, uh, he tells you that your victory at the Sunwell was foretold a long time ago. Uh, so, given that Velen is literally a prophet, guided by the light, uh, did Velen know that this was all going to happen and he knew that he'd have to put a Naru into the Sunwell? Because now there's a Naru core in the Sunwell, and it already caused void entities to come through, so it's obviously not keeping them out. Does that mean that, uh, light entities can come through it as well? Because, again, Velen's kind of the one that put it there. Because how fitting would it be for in the final moments when the Horde is about to achieve victory for the Lightbound to come out of nowhere and save the Alliance and join them? Then what happens when Yorel starts influencing people like Andu and Rin? So now you've got Andu and Rin, Sa'ada, Kalia Menethil, you've got Velen, all of these people in the same faction, all working for the Light, all doing the same thing. What happens when the Light completely starts to take over the Alliance? Well... Good question. If Chronicle is right in what it says about the birth of the universe, at the very beginning there was nothing but light, and then over time it all turned in, it started to turn into void. So is that what's going to happen with the Alliance, considering that they already have void elves? Are they going to all eventually go void, and then we realize how fucked up the light actually is, and why it's a force that we shouldn't have uh, access to? Why the gods shouldn't be giving us this force? Because like I said, the Burning Legion for some reason, has a pretty big problem with the light, and if you read the short stories on the Blizzard website, you can read about how the Burning Legion was not only going around eradicating life, but they were actually trying to stop the forces of the fucking Army of the Light as well, and the Army of the Light was trying to do the same thing to them. It's funny how the Army of the Light doesn't seek out and fight void entities, isn't it? Isn't that kind of interesting, how the Army of the Light always just wanted to try to destroy the Burning Legion? Yeah? In the Burning Legion, allegedly, were the ones that wanted to try to stop the Void? Hmm. Hmm. This seems rather weird now, especially when you couple it with some of my older theories where I've talked about where I think the Holy Light comes from, its relationship to the Void, and how the Titans are using it to manipulate the mortals. But I digress. I'm, I must just be crazy. One last thing. Let's talk about that thing that uh, Kali Amenethil said uh, on the battlefield uh, before she was killed. Um where she came to realize it was time. Well, how funny that she would say something like that, because um, I have a couple other instances where we've heard the phrase, it is time. Uh, how about at the Seed of the Pantheon, when Amun Thul, the god of time, is addressing the mortals for beating Argus, and he says, you have done well, mortals. And Aenar says, it is time. I've brought this up multiple times on my stream, but why the fuck is the goddess of life telling the god of time that it is time? And she says that specific phrase. Guess what? When you're working with Zira, who I'm pretty sure was some kind of tool of Aenar, during the Illidan questline, she also says to you, there is much to be done. I will call upon you again when it is time. And then, once again, we have Kali Menethil saying it was time. Okay? One last thing is that in the Son of the Wolf comic, which a lot of people reference for Anduin's supposed plot armor, in the future you have this comic where in the end, uh, Velen uh, is standing next to Anduin, and Anduin is sitting on a throne, which looks to be in what I can only presume is something like the Exodar, and Velen and Anduin are basically discussing this final battle that is approaching, and no matter what, it ends today, and the light would triumph over Shadow, which I believe is death, by the way, on this day. And, uh, then Velen says to Anduin, High King Rin, it is time. You know the most fucked up part about the comic? Is that Velen has purple eyes in the game, and in the comic, they're white. They're white. Again, there's only a couple characters in all of WoW that have white eyes. And the most prominent one is Aenar, the Lifebinder. Alongside Norganon, the Dream Weaver, you know, like the Emerald Dream, and then Ysera, the Dreamer, an aspect of Aenar. Like, is it is it really this coincidental that all of this shit is lining up? Basically what's happened is even in Sargeras' final moments when he plunged that sword into the world, Aenar and the other Titan Pantheon gods still have an out. They still have a way of influencing the mortals so that they can win. 
Here's the ultimate issue. As I've said multiple times, we don't want the light to win. There has to be a balance. There has to be a balance between life and death, which right now there is not. There has to be a balance between light and shadow, which right now there is not. Don't you guys think it's weird how Naru are not light and void? They're light or void. There's no nice clean middle ground for them where shadow exists. It's either all light or absolutely no light. This is why I'm always trying to say the Naru are not natural light. They were forged by something and they are fucking abominations that shouldn't exist. And the fact that they're out making light undead should be evidence enough that the light is not good. In what in what other fa fantasy universe are undead ever a good thing? Never. Never. And that's why the Forsaken aren't good. That's why what Sylvanas is doing aren't good. The light isn't good. The fucking void isn't good. None of these forces are good in the in the sense that they are going to provide us with something that's actually like the right way meaningfully in the future. Because the issue with forces like the light and the void is that they don't they don't completely like kill what they consume. It becomes part of them, and then whatever the essence of that being is lasts forever that's why the old gods say things to us like the pain of flesh is fleeting true torment lasts forever because flesh mortality allows for you to die the gift itself isn't really the flesh it's more what the flesh allows you to do and that is die that's why there's such an emphasis on death in bfa and that's why nazoth who it looks like sylvanas might actually be allying with is top, it potentially has sway over death. That's why we've heard about learning the truth of shadow, death. That's why we have a giant sword b taken by Sargeras, who's basically fulfilling the role of death, stabbed into our planet, and now this dark energy is flowing within our planet, Azerite's coming out from the ground. You, like, it's so fucking obvious what's going on right now. And the factions are going to continue to turn into more light on the Alliance and more shadow on the Horde. Uh, and if Blizzard does it right, they could actually end up making the Alliance the bad guys. They could make the Alliance these basically fucking like light bound crusade crazy shit uh, trying to take over everything. Uh, and that could actually be how we end up realizing that flesh and the shadow and stuff and the old gods aren't really the bad guys and that the truth is is that the titans and the light and by proxy their creation the void uh is all their fault it's it's them the bad guys the the, the other gods the ones we haven't been fighting against are the are the worst guys in the universe that's <laughs> Sargeras didn't get randomly mad at some void lords that live in another dimension for what they were allegedly trying to do to a world soul he got mad and angry and scared because he realized that it was his own brothers and sisters the pantheon themselves that were fucking up the universe and I hate to go back to this but this is literally exactly how it was written in the RPG lore way 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 back uh, where it's said that Sargeras came to realize that the Pantheon had a falsified ordering of the universe, the order that they were trying to exert, the light, it doesn't say that specifically, but that's what I'm assuming, the light is not natural, they were the cause of the corruption in the universe, and he set out on a crusade to stop them from what they were doing. That's all there is to it. So this whole light thing, the whole light bound thing, the whole Kalia Menethil thing, this shit is no good. It's not good. Uh, and... <laughs> It's going to end up being a really huge fucking problem. Uh, and there are some who I speculate with who believe that they, they think that Kali Aminathil is a literal embodiment of Aenar and that Aenar the Lifebinder is using her as a vessel to influence Anduin Rin. The boy king serves at the master's table, okay? And to be honest with you, I'm kind of on board with them. One other little last thing about Anduin Rin, if you've made it this far in the video, I'm sure you'd love to hear this. His sword that he's got here, Shalomane, this thing right here, back when Varian Rin wielded it, now this is an ancient elven sword that was gifted to Varian Rin by Jaina Proudmoore. Back when Varian Rin wielded it, it had an orangish kind of red light that appeared in the blade. Well, guess what? When Anduin's holding it, it is gold, like light, almost white, white gold, and it shimmers and it makes like a, a chiming sound similar to what you would expect from a Naru who speak literally in song and chimes. Close ranks! Advance has won! Lordaeron will be ours! So, 
Anduin Rin, what I think is going on is that I think that uh, I think that the blade actually could reflect or mimic the soul of its wielder. And because Varian was more of a warrior, he had a soul that burned with more rage. We know Varian had anger problems. Uh, and the very resource that warriors utilize is rage. Um, it makes sense to me that his blade would show with that orangish red tint to it. It's got more of a, a rage encapsulated soul. Whereas Anduin's, he is much more calm at peace with himself and more uh, aligned with the light. And so his, what I presume is his soul, his essence, is reflected as this brilliant, pure light. Here's the thing. There's another warrior, in fact, the greatest and most powerful warrior in the history of the universe, whose soul also burns bright with red. And that is Sargeras. And that is what the red star in the sky is, as these pictures here will show you. So, now that I've gone on for 35 minutes, uh, I think that's pretty much it. I hope that I didn't miss anything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I tend to just get on a, a ramble rant with these, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it, man. If, if you guys are on board with what I'm saying, then I would certainly appreciate if you hit that like button, because likes are the best way to support a content creator and let me know that you, you're enjoying the content that I'm making. If you're new to my channel and you're not uh, afraid <laughs> of, uh, of the crazy speculation that sometimes happens here, please do hit that subscribe button and make sure you become a part of the, uh, the tinfoil crusade. And uh, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. If you guys don't know, I have a Twitter and I have a Twitch uh, account, which I'm partnered on and I stream over there sometimes. You guys should go and follow me over there. I'd love to have you guys um, present for streams. I do live lore crafting and stuff. I chat with you guys, talk about your ideas, talk about my ideas. Uh, it's a lot of fun and I'd like for you guys to, to be a part of that. So stop by my Twitch stream, uh, twitch.tv slash pyromancer. Uh, that's pretty much it, you guys. I, th I think I've rambled on long enough, so I'll, I'll end it there. I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you for watching this video. Stay awesome and until next time, I'll see you guys later. Peace.